right, welcome everybody. I'm Jonathan Haupt, director of our nonprofit, Pat Conroy Literary Center here in Beaufort. This is our October 2022 open mic night presented every month in partnership with the South Carolina Writers Association, our statewide Writers Association. Uh, we've got a really large group of poets and writers and storytellers here with us tonight in our Zoom room, live streaming on Facebook, available later on YouTube. Thank you for joining us and watching this, however and whenever you are doing that. We're really excited to welcome our featured writer tonight, the Poet Laureate of Rock Hill, South Carolina, Angelo Jeter. Angelo will be closing out our evening tonight, uh, but our very first reader, a familiar face, wonderful voice, here in our Conroy Center open mic night, Denise Spencer. So Denise, if you would, please kick us off. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, one brief moment of um, explanation about this poem. I am a relatively new poet, um, uh, started mainly during the pandemic or just before, and um, I'm learning. And I have a friend who every time I use an adverb, chastises me horribly. And um, I don't necessarily agree that they should never, ever, ever be used. And I am not, I like guidelines, but not rules. So I wrote a poem for my friend. It's called Those Dastardly Adverbs. It's hardly fair. Adverbs are perfectly fine words. Unjustly, they wait on the bench to be called into the game, yet wordsmiths seldom invite the assist. To precisely describe all the sensations of life, one must diligently select specific words. To toss away a whole figure of speech ties one's hands unnecessarily. To rigidly avoid adverbs is to take rules much too far. Occasionally, carefully, selectively then, Boldly go where poets rarely do, to the adverb bin, to find just the right word. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that was wonderful, Denise. I appreciate the uh, contextualizing introduction as well. That was great. Thank you for that. You're welcome. All right, our next two readers this evening uh, in this order will be Jackie, followed by Arthur. So Jackie, welcome back. We're glad to have you with us tonight. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And we've got lots of poets tonight. I love that too. Uh, I'm going to start out with reading a couple of poems from my collection that some of you on Facebook probably have already seen that I've got the Rainbow Warrior coming out from the finishing line press. This is just my manuscript. Um, and I started this, um, this research on these South Pacific islands that have been, um, have been bombed by, um, for testing since the 50s, since uh, 1954, I believe is the first one. And I started with Bikini Atoll, but then I have branched out from that because I've learned more about it. So I'll give you just a little background that uh, one day in 1954, a 15 megaton hydrogen bomb detonated on Bikini Atoll in the South Pacific. But it went beyond that because radioactive ash and coral drifted east over the island of Rangalap. So the first two poems I want to share with you are about Bikini Atoll and then the Rangalap Islanders after that. And that poem is called Rainbow Warrior, which is the title poem. And this is Bikini Atoll. One, aqua blue, sun swimming waves, clear living waves, slippery glass waves, slide mirror blue, pile up, slide up on shore, white shore, cradles blue to the horizon. Blue over blue, centuries of blue, palms sway in salt air, swish of palms with the dawn, swish of palms with the night, as your blue with the dawn, indigo blue with the night. Children glide like brown fish in shallows at sunrise. Judah sails the sunlit lagoon. Miasia 
weaves in a fish on the basket of palm fronds. And she weaves in the sun. She weaves fish and the sun, sets on canoes sailing home. Children stop, play in the waves. Mothers pack babies in baskets like bundles. Fathers carry sons and sons carry fathers. Grandfathers bring fish, swimming silver in memory. Grandmothers remember canoes and red sunsets, remember canoes sailing home. Ships transport people away. Oblivious blue slides over reef, oblivious wind skims over surf, wind skims shore, wind bends trees, wind lifts wings, and fly to Bikini Atoll. Men turn themselves into God. Two, bombs explode on Bikini Atoll. 100 times the power of Hiroshima, 1,000 times the power of Hiroshima. The sand, the shells, the fish, the crab, the turtle, the blue, blue liquid rolling in, the arrowroot, the coconut, the milk, the pandanus tree, the worm, the bird, the dreams, the graves, the lives of Bikini Atoll vanish. This is only a test. This is only a test. If an actual emergency occurs, I repeat, this is only a test. That's the end. I started writing that a long time ago and uh, Unfortunately, it's more relevant than ever with the current situation with nuclear arms. The next poem uh, is titled Rainbow Warrior, and it has three definitions of rainbow warrior. One, there's a popular myth attributed to the Cree Indian nation that a rainbow warrior will descend from the sky to save those on earth from extinction. Two is the Rainbow Warrior, a Greenpeace ship that relocated the people of Rangalap from their contaminated island in the South Pacific. And third is a poster that artist Judy Chicago created in tribute to the Greenpeace ship. For the Rangalap people, leaving home on the Rainbow Warrior, escaping radioactive fallout from the nuclear testing. Rainbow warrior cradles the ones from Rongalap, tossed in the night's black sea, lulling sea, a lullaby in night's indigo sky. Moon's bright beam washes white, the bow that plunges low, reaches high to glittery stars. Mast punctures dark seal of sky, releasing bits of salted air, to taste on tips of tongues, wind weaving wisps of hair, a magic web of sleep draping shoulders like nets of fallen stars. Rainbow warrior cradles the ones from Rangalap until a rainbow arcs the morning sky, breaks a million tiny colored beads, bounce on ocean blue. Splash on lashes of Miesia and Miejo, children waking now with sunlit tears, wondering where are our beds, wondering where this big ship goes, and never looking back to Rongelap, mothers, fathers, elders, children, wondering why this morning it is raining tears and rainbows. And just a, so you think that the entire collection is somber, it certainly deals with somber issues, but it ends on a positive note. And um, this is a poem called Full Moon. That is the last page of this book. Full moon, round drum tight belly, embryonic tides ebb, flow. 
the moon ripens as the Navajo waits for its pull. In the rainforest, the moth orchid accepts the random moth, if not broken by wind or rain in its year's slow opening. And I, like a moth orchid, open my petals to the moon. Tides swell in me, I wax, I wane. She gives birth, the orchid blooms, my child self takes form, ink flows like blood. Tides turn, moon sets, the horizon pushes the sun out to the red sky. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Those are incredible. Thank you so much for sharing, giving us a preview of your forthcoming collection. Uh, you Thank mentioned you, it was, it was uh, it's with Finishing Line Press, and, uh, and I imagine all the poets in our Zoom room are probably familiar with Finishing Line, wonderful mm -hmm. publisher. Uh, but you didn't mention when it's coming out. Uh, so when? Okay, when... thank you. Uh, actually, pre-sales started Tuesday, so I'm working on uh, announcement blitz. And those mm -hmm. of you on Facebook may have seen it, but uh, it's pre on pre-sale from now until uh, the first part of December, and it's forthcoming in February or March, uh, 2023. Thanks yes. for me about that. that. Gives me something to think about in terms of uh, a future featured poet in, uh, invitation for you for our open mic night. We've right. I'm thinking of March, Women's History Month and yeah. my working together a tour. You and I will stay in touch about that. Okay, thanks. That conversation. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Absolutely. Arthur, are you ready, sir? I am, Jonathan, thank you. I'm going to read two short ones. Uh, still doing some poetry, but I am branching into literary fiction with the novel and blurb, but, uh, and doing some short stories. But my most recent one from five years ago, publication from Finishing Line Press again. So I, I know the drill <laughs> that some Jacqueline's going through. Uh, <clears throat> this is probably one of the better received ones. So it's called One Morning, you will decide. One morning you will decide that this is the day to escape. Time to load the car, leave the madness and mayhem. Soon we will drive along mesas, snow-capped mountains, along the Natchez Trace and the Appalachian ch chain. Maybe we will leave the car at the airport and fly to that city on the cliff in Spain you saw online or Vienna, where I will lure you to Chopron and show you the family homestead. Tell me when, my love, and I will get the bags from upstairs. Thank you. Now, the other one is relatively new. And um, um, since I stopped teaching, I forget how to share a screen. So you may not see me. I don't know if you'll, what you'll see, but I'm going to call up the poem. Um, I, I love history also. And um, sometimes, my, sometimes my love dovetail. And this is a poem. I was totally straight, sober, what have you. I went to bed and had a dream about uh, Prince Charles Edward Stewart, aka Blind Prince Charlie and his, uh, <clears throat> his qu quick trip to London after the 45 rising a few years later when he went incognito. And uh, the poem came to me in the tercet form, but I sure didn't write that way, so uh, if you see my muse, don't tell, don't tell her. <laughs> I altered the phone form. Whether you see this or not, I don't know. But to the poem, which is entitled The Young Pretender in London. How was it at last to see the places long heard of, not even remembered by your exiled father? Seeing palaces that should or might be your residences, mingling with the crowds under an alias, recognized by a dwindling remnant as you urge them once again to rise up. You change faiths as effortlessly as one changes clothes for dinner. I wonder if as you surveyed the tower, concocting another desperate try for the crown, you remembered Culloden's dead, exiles you refused to receive, months spent hiding, unheeded, the highlands flower fading. The end. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Yes. Uh, thank you for sharing both of those. Uh, before, Appreciate it, Jonathan and everyone. Absolutely. I have a question for you before we transition to our ah, next uh, three yes. writers. And just to forewarn them again of who those three writers are, uh, we'll be going to uh, to Sherry, then to Ashley, and then uh, to Abigail. Uh, but Arthur, uh, could you tell everybody just a little bit about the South Carolina Writers Association's poetry group? Since we I'll have be glad to. Uh, we're in the process of uh, reformation. And I'm speaking as a Lutheran, the Reformation's on my mind this month. And uh, but anyway, uh, um, at next week's conference, next uh, weekend after next um, conference, I'm going to call all poets together. We want to see if we want to meet um, virtually still or if we want to uh, meet face to face. Uh, <clears throat> um, I'm willing to mentor, to listen, to um, I'll let people cry on my shoulder or rant or rave, what have you. Um, we're just trying to <clears throat> uh, revitalize ourselves and to see um, there's a lot of poetic talent here. We've been uh, talking with um, uh, um, uh, Tamara Miles at the uh, Poetry Society of South Carolina about perhaps doing some things uh, in conjunction uh, with them. And uh, I'm really excited. So if you are a poet here tonight and are interested, uh, please um, um, see me on um direct message me on Facebook um, or I dig up my um, Gmail, my email, uh, I'm on Instagram, contact me some way or the other. Um, or if you meet someone who uh, would like to be involved, um, please, uh, we're, we're not actively recruiting for members, although at some point one needs to join to participate fully, but uh, we're just interested in anyone, um, no matter what style they write uh, in their um, so um, please contact me. Uh, the simple email is, uh, I, I keep it simple, aturfa at aol.com. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you. Thank for, you, Jonathan. For doing that and for sharing it with us tonight. I appreciate uh, on both fronts. Sherry, are you ready to join us? Uh, you, you have to unmute um, to do that for us. We're ready to go. Thank you. This is my first time here. I'm a new author. I just had my first short story accepted. Um, I'm a lifetime storyteller, very involved with the Detroit Moth, and then COVID hit. So I started writing. So let me begin. Thank you. One fine day, sentenced to five minutes against the kin kin kindergarten timeout brick wall. Our crime breaking silence. Florence and I continued our crime spree with foreheads pressed on the brick. Our friendship was cemented on that wall. I'm beyond excited. Florence is coming over later. I've been up north at my dad's family farm working the entire summer, alone and bored. I can't wait to hear her voice. We write letters, but they're flat words on a page. The new Mr. Zip gave me five digits for faster delivery. My last letter said in capitals, the end is in sight. The entire time I've been craving a Detroit favorite White Castles, dinner in a cardboard sleeve. My dad will pick up Florence along with the White Castles because her mom who babies her says she's getting over the flu and can't walk. Up north is radio silence. I've been blasting my radio all day between CKLW and WJLB with my mom yelling to turn it down. How could I turn down rhythm of the rain, my boyfriend's back or Cupid? Mom's making a light dinner for card night with my aunt and uncle. I help by wa wrapping the water chestnuts with bacon I'm so thankful for the White Castles. She's making her tomato aspic. Car tires crunch in our driveway and I fling open the front door. I know I should act more adult, I'm 17. Florence bursts into a smile as she steps out of the car. Hugging her, I see how pale she is compared to my sun-soaked tan. I hook her arms with Florence grab the sack of hamburgers and head to my bedroom. Florence flops on her second home bed. She's sad, 
Frankie, her boyfriend, dumped her last week after two years of going steady. And off to college he went. In one of her letters to me, she signed it, Mrs. Francis Herbert Mifflin Jr. I wrote he needed to change his name. Florence wrote back that I was uncool in the square. Stevie's Wonders harmonica blast fingertips and I start to dance. Then I look at Florence and I grimace, you look like you're gonna puke. Thanks, Karen. I'm still in love with Frankie and it just hurts. I started my period to stop to top off having the stomach bug. I remind her there are pads under the sink. I don't mention the tampons. Her mother believes the tampon is the same thing as losing her virginity. My parents are uncool, but not bogus like hers. Florence stands, then she wavers and tumbles on her bed. Bright red splotches of blood glisten on the floor. Florence's eyes are glazed, yet it passes between us. I lay her flat and lift up her legs like we learned in a Red Cross safety class. I scream for my friend's life. Bring the car around to the front door, my uncle says, who's a doctor. Flush everything on the bed down the toilet, I do. My mom says Mount Carmel is the closest hospital and I scream, no Catholic hospital. My uncle grabs the phone, hurriedly speaks. I hear blood dysgrasia, viral infection, honor menses, outside chance of leukemia. He gently carries Florence to the car and I take off and fling myself in the back seat. Florence begins to sputter and breathe like a fish and my uncle stomps on the gas. So I'll stop here, but thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And congratulations on, on your first story publication as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can and you, thanks can you for the pass? memories. I know. <laughs> that I was know. fabulous. That was really fabulous. Beautifully, um, beautifully written. Thank you so much. I appreciate everything. Thank you. Can you tell us where it was published and in what publication, what journal? Um, the Examined Life Journal at the University of Iowa. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you All right, novelist Ashley Cobb Post. <laughs> Thank you, Your Jonathan. Turn, Hello. Thank you for this opportunity for reading. Uh, um, as Jonathan said, I write under the name Ashley Cobb Post because I used to work for a school district for 16 years and I do romance. Uh, I'm an indie Southern fiction author whose stories involve interracial relationships. I'm grateful to be able to share a section of my first sequel, A Journey to Repentance, during my pub week. This novel revolves around three characters' perspectives through the stages of grief after a traumatic event. Tonight, my reading is through the point of view of Dr. Kenny Underwood. Kenny stared at the luminous March sunrise outside of the guest bedroom. The 32-year-old's body's alarm system no longer allowed him to be still. He had showered and must make the decision of what to wear. It was such an easy process, but his head felt like it would explode if he had to make one more decision after the insanity of the past week. Kenny's muscular tan complexion skin legs slid into his jeans. Then he covered his tall, well-toned physique with a denim shirt. As he exited the room, the urge overcame him to proceed to the master bedroom. He paused before opening the door. Slowly, he entered the room as he remembered their last memorable time together. Last night, he could have slept there, but she would not have been by his side. The loss of her presence would have been unbearable. 
Suddenly, he realized he wasn't alone hearing her sobbing. She held his hand and guided him to the hallway as he looked down at her angelic face. Kenny was compelled to comfort Jasmine. Her almost eight-year-old small frame shook gently in his arms as he bent to her level. No words were spoken. Moments later, she pulled him she pulled back and motioned for him to follow her. They descended down the grand staircase to the kitchen. Kenny prepared a light breakfast for them as they ate in silence. Only a week ago, Francesca had shared a similar meal with them. They were a Norman Rockwell picture of happiness. Then Kenny was a husband along with being father to this amazing little girl. How could Francesca have left them? The love of his life had made him a single parent at his early age. He wanted to scream, but had to be strong for Jasmine's sake. Words of wisdom couldn't be formed as Kenny wanted to shield her from this pain. And um, that's part of chapter two of the book. Uh, and I wanna thank um, Jonathan Hopp and the Pat Conroy Literacy Center for this experience so I could share part of my novel. Thank you very much. Thank and you. Tuesday was the pub day. <laughs> Congratulations. Happy pub week. Thank That's you. Yeah. So, like I said, third one's the charm. And <laughs> if I could do a little plug, the first one, don't judge a book. Jonathan did a wonderful book blurb. And my second one, he let me use his photography skills with Crimson Moonlight for the piercing. So thank you, Jonathan. Happy to help. Um, so happy for all the wonderful things happening in your writing life. And I appreciate you being thank you. Uh, a first time reader on our open mic night this month too. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, I appreciate it everyone. Our next writer is also a first time or with us here in the Zoom room. Uh, so Abigail, if you're ready, we'd love to hear from you next. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm the author of Life with the Bird Out the Window, The Untold Legacy, and Forgiving the Past, which you can find on Amazon. But recently, one of my flash, flash fiction pieces titled Consequences was published on spillwords.com and was nominated to be featured in August. So that's what I'm going to read tonight. He lay there for a long time. What had he done? The lights were bright, but he couldn't see. His ears were ringing. Josh tried to run, but his feet wouldn't move. They were planted like concrete. He could hear his mom's voice from a faraway distance. Wake up, son, please. But his body wouldn't listen. It couldn't. His mind was fighting, tearing at the seams to resurface, but his memory of what happened that night was fading. The truth was somewhere in there, but the accident had changed it all. Wait. Bits and pieces were starting to float up. It happened in slow motion. He remembered darkness, rain on the windshield, hitting the brakes, bottles of beers breaking. Wait. There was more. Someone was there. But who? There's a face you can see. It's blurry, but you can hear the screaming. The stillness in the air feels empty, cold, almost like death. And that's it. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Abigail. Thank you for sharing that. Great example of flash fiction. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us for the first time as well. I hope you'll come back. All right, our, let's see where we are in the lineup here. We have uh, three readers left tonight. Tracy, Catherine, if Catherine is back. Catherine, are you back? There you are, yes, thank you. Sorry, couldn't spot you in our group. Uh, and then we'll close out this evening with Angelo. Uh, Tracy, thank you for joining us for the first time as well. We, we really look forward to hearing from you. So uh, welcome. Thank you for having me. Can you hear me okay? Yes, fantastic. Okay, so um, my poems are short, 
and um, I'm actually a spoken word artist. I'm pretty a vulnerable person, so I'll give you a little background about me. Um, I tell people that the pandemic was a blessing in disguise for me because two years ago, I was a pre-K teacher's assistant. And um, basically, I took a leap of faith to go after my poetry, my writing, and it hasn't stopped um, since 2020. So I actually got accepted recently on Poets and Writers. So I'm on Poets and Writers now for spoken word. So this, thank you. This um, poem is called Hiding Behind the Corner. I used to be the girl hiding behind the corner. I felt like a loner. Yet even when I cried, I thought I had died to a world I had to face, but still the people lied. I must admit I couldn't take it. I truly believed I wouldn't make it. Then one day something inside this vessel said, don't fake it, but break it. So I broke the walls that were tearing me apart and ripping out my heart until the fall was about to hit, came into a line for starts. I just kept running since I couldn't stop. I ran like a criminal trying to get away from the cops. I got rid of the haters, the perpetrators, the two faces and the instigators. I changed my way of thinking and didn't mind blinking. If times are too hard, I wouldn't stack it up with those deck of cards. I became stronger, could stand longer. Not I'm trying to measure up to a world going under. I gained respect and advanced my intellect to a place I didn't expect. Now I can walk up to a person untimid and shy. I'm a newfound eagle and I'm ready to fly. I have to speak before my spirit leaps with anticipation, determination, imagination, and an accepted application. No, I'm not always accepted by those around me, but my soul has life that a blind person can see. I have a voice that needs to be spread in order to have true peace in my head. My spirit creates a difference in the essence of the confident presence I showed when I decided not to be led. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. That was wonderful, truly. Wow. That was awesome. That was, great. that was incredible, Tracy. I was uh, watching in gallery view and everybody's eyes just went like that when you, when you flipped that switch. And that was amazing. You do that so well. <laughs> You have to come back. Uh, I don't want that to be optional for you. I want to see you on the Zoom screen every time we do open mic from now on. That's a requirement. That was amazing. And you'll encourage others to come with spoken word poetry to yes. open mic. And that's really important. We need those voices. So thank you so much. Yes, we really appreciate you being here and, and taking a risk and doing this uh, particular open mic for the first time. We really appreciate that. Catherine, you've been with us a couple of times now, and it's always a joy to hear your voice as well. So thank you for coming back this month. Thank you. So I, I have a, a public service announcement first. So I was at um, the Pink Promenade over the weekend where um, one of the gift baskets included my book. And then when they found out I was there, I got called up, got to talk. So that was really awesome. But I wanted to show you this. This is a cookie that they gave away. So when you look at it, you're like, huh, what the heck is that? So basically what it is, is let me see if I can get that close enough. It is your reminder to get a mammogram. So it's, you know, the squishy play. <laughs> so not everyone on here will relate, but um, Yes. <laughs> it's October, so of course, I want to read again from Driving Pink. And this is a um, section of one of the chapters called What 1000 People Will See. So in October 2015, I wrote the blog post, Owning Your Power, Mine's Currently Pink. And I shared the somewhat prophetic phrase of a medical practitioner early in my journey. Before you're done, people will ask to see your boob a thousand times. And she was right. I lost track of the number of people who began a medical experience with the phrase, let's just take a look. There is little dignity available to patients and what we might cover with modesty in the normal course of life becomes fully exposed time and again as nurses, 
for technicians, prep us for viewing, touching, tattooing, positioning, and performing exams and procedures on. Doctors, surgeons, oncologists, radiologists, a seeming never-ending carousel of people will see and touch your breast. You will need to find an inner dignity and strength. Over and again, you'll be walked into a room and instructed to put on the gown open to the front. Let's be honest, there's no reality in which we can call those thin cotton string tied garments a gown. Arriving to an exam or procedure armed with the latest research and a list of questions helped me mentally clothe myself with information. Some medical practitioners see and treat us as humans. Others focus on the clinical component of our care, treating our body as a thing to be acted upon. And although this did not hold true for all the individuals providing my care, generally female doctors demonstrated greater sensitivity. Male doctors would walk in with a colleague into the room and then ask if I minded, which I mentally translated as, hey, I've brought yet another perfect stranger to view you with curiosity, aren't I awesome? Oh wait, you don't mind, do you? Let's pause a moment on this concept of the doctor who brings in a colleague. You have the right to say no. Practice this phrase, I would prefer not to. I would prefer not to have yet another person present. You can ask, is this medically necessary? If there's a problem where the consultative experience of the colleague is beneficial to you, you're free to consent. You don't have to agree, however, to the array of tag along type people. If I sound like I was always successful at tapping a core of inner strength, I was not. Most of the time, yes. Always, nope. I have an acute memory of the time I was in the room with three medical technicians preparing me for a radiation treatment. Imagine laying on a relatively narrow table. The surface is hydraulically lifted to make the height convenient to workers and a bright light shines a grid pattern on your exposed body. Multiple people push, pull, push, and position you to line up various tattooed dots marking your body with the lit grid to precisely focus radiation treatment. Slowly, tears started running down my face and I felt like a piece of meat, dehumanized. And the sole female technician asked if I was all right, if they needed to stop if I needed a few minutes. I could not put into profound, uh, to words the profound loss of personal dignity. And so I just responded with a no, do what you have to do to get it done. Such moments are normal. Readers, if you're the family member or support, there is nothing wrong with the patient. Ask if she wants to share or if there's something that you can do. But sometimes what we need is not active solace. What we need is to process or to know our support is there for us. A journey of uncertainty can also bring moments of fear into a patient or her family. The reflection sections of my chapters, I'm gonna skip that. If you're the patient, be gentle with yourself, allow for emotion to wash over you and find a way to give that feeling a name. There is no embarrassment or shame in being human. While it's healthy to acknowledge and accept our experiences of fragility, it's not healthy to make a home and dwell there. To be resilient, we have to undergird ourselves with self-care, with respite, and with most of all, finding our personal happy place. Oh, thank you, Catherine. Um, you read that so beautifully, and I know not all of that is easy to read. We can we can see and feel your emotions even through the screen. Uh, it's but it's beautiful. It's powerful work and and timely as well. So thank you for joining us and and for sharing. Our featured poet this month, and it is now that time, gang. Um, it is an absolute honor to welcome to our Zoom room, Angelo Jeter. Uh, for those of you who haven't had a chance to hear Angelo read, uh, either in person or, or to see recordings of this, 
you were about to be blown away as I was the first time I encountered Angela's videos. It, it's an absolute honor to have you here with us and I appreciate you accepting the offer. Uh, we are also in communication about um, some other opportunities with our Conroy Center as well. Also, I, not the last time, I hope this is the first of many times that we are co collaborating with Angelo Jeter. He is an award-winning poet, educator, author, and performance artist, and currently serves as the Poet Laureate of Rock Hill, South Carolina. He's also a 2020 Academy of American Poets Laureate Fellow. Uh, were that not enough, and I assure you it is not, Angelo is also a 2018 National Poetry Slam champion, a Rust Belt Regional Poetry Slam finalist, a Southern Fried Regional Poetry Slam finalist, and, 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 the founding director of the One Word Poetry Festival. His work has appeared on All Deaf Poetry, Charleston Currents, Gratefulness.com, and the Academy of American Poets, Poem a Day series, and his debut poetry collection, More God Than Dead, was released in June of this year. Everybody, let's welcome Angelo as our featured writer for our October open mic night. Thank you for joining us, Angelo. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Can y'all hear me pretty well? We're good. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, uh, John, for, for one, for the Invitation to be here. This is quite an honor, um, honestly. Uh, even though it's virtual, I feel like I'm physically in the space. So that's really, it's really good for the invitation to be here. Um, and thanks for the way you read that bio. I don't. It's always funny, like when people are reading stuff about you, because like I don't remember doing all that, but I guess I did. And you know, and, and I don't really care about accolades, but it's it's cool to to have folks, um, you know, appreciate that. So thank you for for that so much. Uh, and thanks for looking into my work um, as well prior to today. So. Um, that really, really means a lot. And thanks to everyone that's read so far. This has been amazing. I've really been enjoying for a while. I just had my, my camera off because I like, you know, when I make scrunchy faces when it's a nice line or something, I want everybody to see that. Uh, but uh, but it's been it's been really beautiful um, hearing hearing your work tonight. So thank you for for being in the space and sharing uh, yourself. I do have uh, some poems, <laughs> right? What we here for? I do have some poems to share uh, with you tonight. Um, two of them, uh, kind of, uh, I believe her name was Tracy. Yeah. So as Tracy, um, mentioned, uh, I'm also a spoken word artist as well. That's my, that's my, I guess my, my initial kind of entry into, um, poetry. Well, not initial, but that's been kind of how it would have been the majority of my work, uh, over time, but I've been writing, um, uh, as well. And so I just released a, uh, debut co collection and, uh, so I'll be reading most things from there, but I'm going to do about two spoken word pieces as well, just to kind of show uh, the different things that I do um, as well with that. So with that being said, no further ado, I'll get right into the poem. So I stopped talking like, why are you just saying these crazy things to me, sir? Um, but uh, I'll get right into it. This first piece is called Family Tree. Um, and it just talks about um, basically growing through relationships. And I'll just go ahead and say that this set is pretty much going to be about the idea of losing things and rebuilding things and growing. Uh, so a lot of these poems will, will touch on that. <clears throat> good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I was born September 21st, 1986 in Columbia, South Carolina to a mother named Mary and a father named Joseph. And no, my name ain't Jesus, y'all, it's Angelo. I graduated with a bachelor's degree in 2008. I currently work at that same college where every day I mentor kids who look just like me. My mother calls me her little miracle. The concrete generation, my poetry friends know me as I am big. For the most days, I just call myself a coward, a lonely man hiding behind a telephone pole on a dark stage, trying to redial the memories of my broken childhood, but I keep dropping the calls. It's like my father kept dropping the calls for 13 years. So my parents divorced when I was five. Didn't see him again until I was 17, which, which means I never fully grew into my manhood. Didn't quite finish my process of photosynthesis. You see, I still have chlorophyll stuck in my cuticles. Chloroplast plastered to the cell membrane in my chest. My eyes are redder than a bed of roses on a Sunday afternoon. I've got ferns for feet. A sunflower smile. You can see roots growing out of my rib cage. I'm trying to sprout new limbs. That yellow beam in the sky. 
is the closest I've ever come to having my own personal ray of sunshine. I am praying that one day my, my light can dance, the same light that dances inside my father's eyes. When I turned five, he told me, no matter what, what happens, he would always live inside of fear. And though I was severely aggravated by his absence, I've been watering this garden of fatherhood for years, planting fruitless flowers of hope, sprouting from seeds of doubt. See, I'm just trying to fertilize my faith in him hoping the skeleton tree in my chest can finally have some leaves to grow from these long and, and lonely branches. And, you know, it's kind of ironic that I was born in the fall because every year people start changing colors and dropping out of my life. Dear God, why was I cursed to live in this long and lonely season? Why couldn't I be bright like summer or, or fresh like spring? Dear daddy, please don't mistake the scientific notation as a hate poem. This is honestly the most beautiful sunflower sonnet these vine-like fingers have ever written. I'm just trying to climb my way back into the family tree, hoping that your dandelion eyes and magnolia tree spirit can provide enough shade to hide my pain. Or I just want to redial my childhood, hoping that the caller ID tattooed in your chest can finally recognize your son's DNA. So, so pick up the phone. Let's star 69 our emotions. Revive the fire, which made me worship the ground you walked on and not the one you walked out on. Use your oxygen like smile to breathe life back into our relationship. And I promise that I will bury the past if you are willing to start digging towards our future. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. My name, my name is Angelo. I have a heart like a greenhouse and a father whose hands are weeping willows. I am praying that one day we can both start growing again. Thank y'all so much. Thank y'all so much. I, I appreciate that. You know, the fun thing about, I'm glad y'all enjoyed that. The fun thing about Zoom is that you can like, you can snap, but you can also do like really weird and funky things in the screen. <laughs> as well you know you don't have to just, just do the normal clapping thing so if you feel inspired to do such dances or backflips or whatever whatever you want to do even those watching uh on the facebook stream however you choose uh you know to show your appreciation for something i appreciate that in a, in a normal poetry uh cafe we would say you know you definitely want to snap and that you want to make noises like mm, and ooh and ah aha and my personal favorite, yes. So if any of those are sizzling in your spirit, feel feel free to, <laughs> to show that. Even though I can't hear it, I can feel the energy. Feel free to do that if you wish. But if not, that's OK, too. Uh, so I'll, I'll go ahead and read a couple of poems from my uh, debut collection. Um, first of all, I want to shout out to Muddy Ford Press out of uh, Columbia, South Carolina uh, for uh, allowing me the opportunity to publish my first collection with them. I think it's something special that my first collection is from my hometown. Um, and while I didn't know Cindy and Bob, the, uh, the editors and owners of Muddy Ford, prior to that, I think it's just certain things are just serendipitous and just happened the way they're meant to. Uh, and we really wanna show a lot of love to Ed Madden as well, who was the editor uh, through this process and made some very tough cuts uh, that I think made the poems a lot better as well. So here is the what the book looks like is uh, More God Than Dead. Uh, it's on Amazon. I have a website as well, angelogeter.com, if you want to purchase it there, uh, and other online retailers. Uh, and, and if you're here in Rock Hill, South Carolina, there are a few places where you can actually find the book as well, the Mercantile and the Winthrop University Bookstore. Coming soon to another store near you. So I want to read a couple pieces from that. Um, as I mentioned um, earlier, you know, the set is kind of about, you know, losing things and, and trying to rebuild and regain. And that's essentially what this collection is about too. It's about loss and grief and, and resilience. And I remember someone earlier was also talking about um, their, their novels kind of focus on walking through the stages of grief. And that's exactly what I do in this book too. Um, and so this poem kind of talks about my relationship with, uh, from an early age, my relationship with water or lack thereof with water and how that has kind of evolved over time uh, in relation to losing something. It's called Blue. Blue, I never learned how to swim. I almost drowned at a pool party in the sixth grade. I was the only dark body there. When I saw the ivory colored kids somersault off diving board into the cold sanctuary below, I wanted to feel what they felt. 
to be free enough and safe enough to jump into something that could kill me. So I jumped and quickly sank until my arms were failing ferociously, trying to grab onto something I couldn't see, like God or love. For a moment, I felt weightless, a black boy bird flying with no restraint until the water reminded me I was human. I have a hard time remembering when I fell in love with water. Truly don't recall the moment waves enchanted my innocent eyes and unearthed new worlds in these peoples. Perhaps it was in elementary school when I was scribbling outside the lines, when I had not yet become acquainted with the burden of barriers, was not familiar that dark lines were a thing you were not supposed to cross. At that age, we glided crayon across paper with no intention of halt, danced over barricades until we made them beautiful. We would dig our hands in warm sand and soft beach, submerging feet underneath the blue until we could no longer see where we stood. I loved the feeling of enveloping myself into something larger than myself. In college, a brown-skinned girl with a sharp tongue and a soft smile taught me how to float in the water to glide and extend limbs in a straight line until my body turned still. She was also instructing me in a crash course on love, the art of stretching out and leaping until joints tire of exhaustion, to jump off of faith into a pool of uncertainty. I vowed to always study the aquatics of her. So when I visit the cemetery that now houses her bones, I stare at the lake that surrounds her, use these sea legs to swim to her gravesite and extend my arms like a black bird trying to spread its wings. Uh, when, I, when I read that poem, sometimes people are like, oh, you tricked us. <laughs> it wasn't just about swimming. Uh, so uh, as that poem indicates, this book is essentially about um, losing uh, my late wife. Um, she passed in 2017. Uh, and uh, one thing about losing people, and we're in a season of loss, I'm seeing a lot of that on Facebook, a lot of friends I know, uh, myself personally as well, and I'll touch on that again, um, but uh, we're in a season of loss, and when you're losing something, you're not only losing the person, but you're, you're losing what you knew, right, your life, and, and how you knew things to be at that time as well, uh, and so uh, it's very easy to kind of get in a state of, of, of being down and depressed, because it's not just losing them, but it's losing the things that are associated with them. And so uh, it took me some time to, you know, through my healing process of figuring out just who I was and, you know, how I could be the person I am now. Um, and, and it was hard to find things to be joyous about, you know, in, in, those, in those moments. Um, but I had to learn that if there's a reason that I'm awake and alive the next day, that I made it to the next day, there's something worth being joyful about, right? It's something worthy of being praised and worthy of praising. And so this poem is a is an ode to that, if you will. It's not an ode, but it's an ode to that in a sense. Uh, and it's called Praise as well. Praise. Today I will praise. I will praise the sun for showering its light on this darkened vessel. I will praise its shine. Praise the way it wraps my skin in ultraviolet ultimatums demanding to be seen. I will lift my hands in adoration of how something so bright to be so heavy. I will praise the ground that did not make feast of these bones. Praise the casket that did not become a shelter for flesh. Praise the bullets that called in sick to work. Praise the trigger that went on vacation. Praise the chalk that did not outline a body today. Praise the body for still being a body and not a headstone. Praise the body for being a body and not a police report. Praise the body for being a body and not a memory that no one wants to forget. Praise the memories. Praise the laughs and smiles you thought had been evicted from your jawline. Praise the eyes for seeing and still believing, for being blinded from faith, but never losing their vision and praise the visions. Praise the prophets who don't profit off of those visions. Praise the heart for housing this living room of emotions. Praise the trophy that is my name. Praise the gifts that is my name. Praise the name that is my name, which no one can plagiarize or gentrify. Praise the praise, how the throat sounds like a choir. The harmony in your tongue lifts into a song of adoration. Praise yourself 
for being able to praise, for waking up when you had every reason not to. Thank y'all so much. I appreciate that. Really, really do. <laughs> I would try to raise the energy up. I know it's been a little low. We're gonna, we're gonna raise it up at the end of this, right? So I'm gonna start a little, start a little bit heavy, and then we're gonna get a little bit lighter, right? Because you know, as we're going through, and and that's what I did in this book is, um, at least I hope I did it. I, what I think I did, and which I hope that people agree that I did, is you know, it's heavy, there's heaviness in it, and it's heaviness when we're talking about grief and loss and and working through it. Uh, but it's also joy in remembering the life of the person and remembering things about yourself, you know, and um, we get so sometimes bogged down with the loss itself or the idea of just losing something. And loss isn't just people, it's things. Some people lost jobs, some people lost cars and homes, some people lost themselves, their identities, right? Uh, and so uh, it's so easy to get kind of caught up in the loss of something, but the fact that you're uh, grieving the loss means there was something that was beautiful about the life, right? And so um, this poem is one of those things that I tried to do in the book is celebrate the life and celebrate the beautiful times uh, as well. So this is called Black Girl Fly. Black Girl Fly. My girl is fly. And not fly as in helicopter or airplane or kite cascading across a sunset. I mean fly as in dope, fresh, trendy, sexy. So fly the wind asks for her permission to speak. So fly NASA consults her before sending shuttles beyond this galaxy. Fly like black birds somersaulting on a blue playground of sky. Fly like stiletto heels tall enough to reach heaven's backyard. Fly like walking into a room and stealing the spark in everyone's faces, turning any venue into a runway. Fly like she came to slay everything. And all you can do is watch yourself become prey. So fly, every follicle of hair is laid like a prayer, bowing to the temple of her edges. So fly, she convinces me to buy her sundresses every summer, like spending my money is her favorite pastime. She'll flash a smile and say, Ange, in a tone that weakens the grip of my wallet and serenades the crease of my lips into a smile I can't resist. So fly, I never complain. I gladly carry anything her flesh leaves an imprint on. My girl is so fly. She makes me believe gravity doesn't have jurisdiction over this blanket of flesh and flight is our native tongue. So fly, she makes a hospital gown look like fashion week. So fly, the nurses at CMC Pineville know her by name, greet her with a smile that says, I hate you back here, but I'm also happy to see you. So fly, she's had more surgeries than birthday parties. So fly, the doctors gave her six months to live and she refused to stick to their timeline. So fly, she talks to God on a first name basis and writes a gospel with her tongue. Thank y'all so much. I appreciate that. So I'm telling brother self-promotion. So while it's on my mind, uh, if you enjoy what you're hearing, please visit uh, my website, angelogeter.com. You can see some videos of, of poems uh, that I've done in the past. Uh, and you can also uh, purchase the book there also and kind of just see things I have going on my schedule uh, and the different things I'll offer. But also if you're a fan of Amazon and Barnes and Noble and all those other places, feel free to uh, purchase the book there uh, also. And you can follow me on here, Angelo T. Jeter, uh, or uh, on Instagram at Iambic, which is E-Y-E-A-M-B-I-C. E Y E A M B I C. Uh, and that was my like, and it still is. That was my stage name when I started uh, doing spoken word and slam. And so it's kind of it just it's stuck. So uh, if you like what you hear, feel free to follow what I'm doing. This is, uh, with that being said, this will be the last poem I do uh, tonight. Uh, and this has been beautiful. Thank you all for the energy and everything as well. Um, we've had a couple poems um, tonight about um, breast cancer. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month which I think is, is, you know, it's great that we celebrate that because cancer is a terrible thing. Um, but I think it's, it's beautiful that we can celebrate people who have survived it. And even those who haven't, we remember them. Um, and I mentioned earlier about uh, a recent uh, lost journey for me. So my mom actually recently passed away about three uh, weeks ago. Um, and this is actually the first reading I'm doing since, um, since she passed, which is even more special to be here. Uh, and had a long fight with 
with breast cancer and um and metastasis right in different places and she fought hard she fought a good fight um but when i when i thought about what i was doing tonight i'm like i would think it's best to honor the month by honoring her uh through this poem and so um but this is called wonder woman i'm gonna try to not cry through it <laughs> for as long as i can remember my mother has been the strongest woman i've ever known a queen whose face is made of stone, jigsaw puzzles in her teeth, piecing the truth together. Her eyes are bridges that connect the past with the future. And she's what I like to call a straight shooter. Will tell you exactly what she feels, doesn't care what you think or how you feel about it. Wears her heart on a collarbone like a diamond necklace. Holds pyramids in her palm so you can feel the royalty in her embrace when she hands you a fistful of compassion. And my mama has a monument for a heart. Hieroglyphics in her tongue decipher the elegance in her speech. She is a small, a strong and proud woman. A woman who'll put on high heels just to walk to the grocery store. Will put on full makeup and get her face beat to the gods just so she can go to the gas station because she believes that queens should never leave the house looking like peasants. And she's a superstitious woman. Believes that aspirin and vinegar can heal anything. And I'm talking arthritis, gout, scoliosis, coronavirus, the flu, you name it. She thinks these things can heal it. And that's why I love her so much. She makes ordinary things seem remarkable. Like how she can take a 50 cent box of noodles, add some egg, milk, and cheddar, make the most delicious pan of macaroni and cheese you ever tasted in your life. So good, it made Jesus smack his own mama. Rumor has it that she once put Bigfoot in the headlock, smacked Godzilla in the face and told him that his breath stink, killed Moby Dick, rolled him in flour, threw it in a pan and called it a fish fry. Yo, my mama is a gangster. I'm convinced she's thrown a couple bodies in the river. Because when I was younger, she performed drive-bys on me with a switch, a hanger, extension cord, belt herself, anything, but ever got out of line. When she was done, she let me cry. Remind me that she ain't raised no punk. Show me that being a man had nothing to do with the size of your genitalia, but everything to do with the enormity of your character. My mama had the strength of Harriet Tubman, the grace of Cleopatra, and the style of Michelle Obama. She is a war machine with missiles shooting from her tongue that stopped men dead in their tracks and brought them down to her knees. Living proof that the most dangerous weapon in America is the voice of a Black woman. And it proves that Black lives do matter because she has birthed them and raised them and fought for them more than she has fought for herself. Mom is also a survivor. Just the past year, she fought her biggest battles yet with a giant and cancer and a tightening heart disease. And although one of those things took her breast, it can never be strong enough to steal her heart. Not vigilant enough to cut off her air supply because y'all, she is the air, a floating force too big to escape, yet too small to hold on to, a constant reminder that yeah, God sent a son to save us, but he created a woman to raise us. Thank y'all so much, that's my time. Thank you, John, I really appreciate uh, appreciate being here. Thank y'all so much, I love it. Oh, wow. Thank you so much, Angela. That was incredible. There's a lot of love happening for you in the chat here in our Zoom room uh, and also in the comments on the Facebook live stream as well. And I know not everybody can see both of those things, but that was so powerful. What, what you do so beautifully is take grief and joy and hope and roll all of those things up and give them a home in, in verse and poetry. It's so powerful uh, and to hear it, in your voice, literally in your voice, so just adds to it. And that was that was amazing. Wow. Thank you anybody so much, else? John. It really means a lot. Anybody else want to chime in for uh, for Angela while we're still here while we got a few minutes? 
I just want to say Black Girl Fly, uh, the, that's the second time I've heard you perform that poem because I heard it at the Fall Lines release. And as, as you started, I was like, I've heard this before. And I, it's such a joy. I love that poem so much. And there's so much heart and so much love in it. And I just want to thank you for bringing it back into my life because I just, I like, I, you, sometimes you don't realize you're missing it until it comes back around. I'm like, man, so I'm, I'm, I'm one of those that have just added to your follows and all that. Angela, you're such a gift. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Casey. And you're an amazing writer yourself. So I really appreciate that coming from you. Incredible. Angelo, when did you write that last poem about your mother? You just lost her three weeks ago? My goodness. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so I, uh, I've had that poem for some years. Um, I think it was around 2015, 2016 when I wrote it. Um, but it, it just always feels, you know, still very fresh, you know, in terms of Oh yeah, my, the emotions and things with it as well. So that's why I keep it in my repertoire. But yeah, I've had it for some for some time. Did you, did you share it with her? I did. So here's the here's the really um, beautiful thing is I had that poem for that long, but I didn't get to perform it in front of her until um, last January. I had a um, a feature, and she was uh, she ended up she was staying with me. And um, so we did the feature, and uh, and she was right in the front row, and it's the first time she had actually see me perform it live. She had seen a video of it, um, but she got to see me do it live. So that was really special that I had the, the chance to do that. Uh, then, and then in April again for the uh, One Word Poetry Festival, I did the poem again uh, and she was there as well. And it was the day before her birthday, which was also great. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Well, it's lovely. And I, I um, it resonates with me. I've been trying to write some things for my mother who is mm. in a nursing home at this point and, um, and uh, suffers with a little dementia. And so all of the things that trigger her memory um, are really helpful. And, um, and um, I think it, uh, mothers still want to see everything their kids do and are just as proud as they were, you know, the day you were born. And so I'm certain that meant a lot to her to hear those. That was great, thank you. Thank you for that, I appreciate that, thank you. And prayers to you and your, your mom as well. This is, uh, this is such a good reminder tonight of, of why we do this and what can result from it. What, what an amazing group of writers we had tonight. What an eclectic, diverse chorus of voices too. Uh, and we appreciate the partnership we have with South Carolina Writers Association, which has made open mic possible for Help me with the math, Casey. I think like three years now, not perhaps not uninterrupted, but I think uh, I think it's been going on for about three years now. And to have poets still coming uh, multiple times and voices in the room for the very first time almost every single month is just uh, a reason to keep doing this work. So I so appreciate all of you being with us tonight in the Zoom room and special thanks to everybody joining us out there watching this video both live and afterwards. Uh, we'll be back again second Thursday of next month as well, uh, live on the Conroe Center Facebook page. Good night, everybody, and thank you. Thank you once again. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for sharing, Angelo. It was a great, great experience to listen to everyone tonight. It was awesome. Thank you. Thanks everyone for your participation. It was wonderful. Very wow. enriching. Thank you. Thank you Arthur, for the opportunity. Arthur, I'll see you at the conference. We'll talk. All right. We'll talk to poetry. <laughs>